when it started getting a bit more serious about your photography, people who've been in the game for a bit longer than you come out with these esoteric expressions that are supposed to artistically educate you in some way. I'm sure you know the expressions I'm talking about. Like, if you have watched 50 videos about composition here on YouTube, then your bingo card would be full pretty quickly if it included leading lines, foreground interest, shapes and texture, rule of thirds, and layering. When I first heard these expressions during my transition from accidental landscape photographer to guilt-free photo nerd, I just thought it was a load of valueless mouth farting by pretentious wankers. And to be brutally honest, a lot of it was just valueless mouth farting by pretentious wankers because they were just repeating what they heard someone else say in the hopes that it would make them sound all learned and shit and that I would be deeply impressed by their insights into the photographic process. But what if I was to tell you that a bit like ancient weather lore, there was actual science behind those oft-recited photographic maxims, that there is rock solid, actionable logic to be gleaned from the beard-stroking hipster handbook, and that you really can use that logic to elevate your photographic skills and compositional prowess. So, before you tell your Noel acquaintance to stick his foreground interest where his leading line don't shine, let's cut through the bullshit and expose the naked scientific truth of composition. No fancy framing required. My artistic bullshit radar is always switched on and regularly pinging contacts. I have an allergic reaction to lofty explanations of art, which meant for a long time I just dismissed it all out of hand and simply followed my instincts for better or worse. Usually worse. The fact that after 40 odd years of photography, my gut instincts have eventually landed me squarely back in the same wheelhouse as those lofty expressions proves you can teach an old dog new tricks, but it might take a minute. I'm a trained journalist though, and I have an unquenchable compulsion to look at the facts behind any statement. So I decided to find out if there was any science to back up the photographic guidance dispensed so readily here on YouTube. I've been wandering through a few of the well-known pirated archives of scientific papers looking at the science behind compositional techniques. Now I'm ready to share my discoveries with you all. I'll even include a few citations in the description below should you wish to go and read said source material for yourself or, you know, if you suffer from insomnia. At the scientific core of an understanding of composition in photography is something called Gestalt. This is a German word that roughly translates to shape, form or figure. But more importantly, it's the idea that a whole is perceived as more than the sum of its parts. The reason this is so important to us is due to the way that the brain of Homo sapiens developed over the last 300,000 years or so. As a way of surviving, we became experts at perceiving patterns and configurations in something. Not just the individual components, but the way things are ordered. Our Big old ape brains then naturally organise those individual elements into a unified whole. We just can't help ourselves. Every human being on planet Earth, and even some stranded survivors on LV-426, have self-organising tendencies. It's quite literally in our DNA, and it's why we can instinctively look at a photograph and understand that it feels right or balanced. So, understanding Gestalt principles, how the human brain naturally processes visual information, will help you make more cohesive, visually appealing compositions. The scientific principles defined in Gestalt theory are proximity, similarity, closure, continuity, and relationship. And using this, you can help get your photographs closer to compositional excellence. The principle of proximity says that our brains naturally groups similar elements together 
to create a sense of unity in a scene. There are numerous scientific papers on this subject, including visual brain and visual perception. How does the cortex do perceptual grouping? Published in 1997. In that paper, researchers showed that neurons in the visual cortex that process nearby elements tend to activate together which creates a unified perception of them. Our brains interpret a scene from its simplest features to its most complex objects, and they do so in a strict running order. It's almost like our brains are just big old computers, isn't it? Real-time imaging studies have shown that the brain actively predicts what it expects to see. Similar features synchronize our hard-working neurons. When it comes to compositions in photography, all that means that if you group similar elements close together, you will create a sense of unity, which will be visually pleasing to the brain. The second gestalt principle is similarity. And this does not mean you should make your photos look like everyone else's. A paper titled Top Down Influences on Visual Processing from 2013 showed how higher level cognitive processes influence the grouping of similar elements. When viewing a scene or a photograph of a scene, our brains automatically group together similar items without conscious effort on our part. And when multiple similarities exist in a scene, the brain prioritizes them, which quite literally makes the scene pleasing to the eye. The similarities don't have to be shapes, though that is the most common theme in photography, that line of sand dunes, disappearing the horizon, for instance, or a series of hill or mountain ridges. Color and textures also work well alongside shapes, and they grab the viewer's attention, whether they like it or not. The danger, of course, is that you could overdo the similarity, which can lead to a quite boring-looking scene. So remember to balance the similarity principle with the other gestalt concepts. One of the most valuable ways of adding interest to a composition is to add a sense of intrigue or mystery to it. No, not a big cat sighting in Romford or a Sasquatch striding through a pumpkin patch. I'm talking about the sense of mystery when your brain has to fill in the gaps. The neuroscientific basis for this one is the way that our brains constantly make predictions about incoming sensory information. And when there are gaps, it tries to fill them in based on prior experience and the context that they sit in. What this means is we effectively see the missing parts of an image, whether we want to or not, because our neurons summon up what might be there. It's called the closure principle, because our brain tries to complete any given scene, and this process is pleasing to us in ways we implicitly understand but cannot readily articulate. So I use this one in your landscape photography, Consider a way of photographing the scene such that it's obscured in some way, such that someone viewing that photograph will have to fill in the gaps and bring closure to it. Think mystery and let your mind wander. Mountain tops obscured by clouds. Morning mist shading a lake. The trunk of a large tree partially obscuring a field beyond. A natural arch through which you can see a further sea are pleasing to the eye because the mind has to fill in the gaps. I think the old leading lines technique is one of the very first I learned about, pretty sure I read about it in one of Charlie Waite's books back in the day. The science behind this one is that our brain's neurons preferentially link elements that follow smooth paths or continuous lines. There are heaps of papers on this subject going back many years, my favourite which was the snappily named contrast-sensitive perceptual grouping and object-based attention in the laminar circuits of primary visual cortex. There are, of course, many ways of creating those pleasing-looking leading lines, twisting country lanes, the course of a river, the furrows in a ploughed field, the fence line next to it, even star trails. They all key into our brain's satisfaction for paths and lines and compositions that use them look aesthetically pleasing and feel balanced. And finally, we have the figure ground principle, which is all about how our brains physically separate the elements in a scene. I have learned that the visual cortex's neurons respond differently to the same edge, depending on which side the aforementioned figure is located, which helps us determine what's foreground and what's background. 
you can use this brain behavior to influence the viewer's attention by creating an isolated element in a scene or by using negative space creatively. Now you know why those lonely tree in a field photos are so popular. It's because your brain's responding happily to the disparate elements of the scene. You can pull off that figure ground effect in many different ways, of course. Portrait photographers use a shallow depth of field to isolate the subject from the background, for instance. They can also use contrast, lighting, or framing to achieve a similar effect. And the ease with which the viewer is able to perceive that segregation creates an emotional response in the brain. So as it turns out, it wasn't just a load of artistic doublespeak. There are solid scientific reasons behind why some photographs look right and some do not. When I was thinking about these concepts, I realized that this, in essence, is what people mean when they say someone has a good photographic eye. It means they implicitly understand those complex relationships of light structure, texture, line, and form. And they use it whether they do so consciously or not. So the next time you're out in the field, camera in hand, remember, you're not just taking photos, you're conducting a grand neurological experiment. Your compositions are tapping into millions of years of evolution, tickling the very circuits of perception that helped our early ancestors spot both predators and prey. And that good eye you're developing, it's not just artistic intuition, it's your brain becoming a finely tuned gestalt machine effortlessly processing proximity, similarity, closure, continuity, and figure ground relationships. Who knew that becoming a better photographer meant also becoming a part-time neuroscientist? But go forth and fear not the pretentious mouth fart. Compose with confidence, and remember every great shot you take is a triumph of art and science. Your ancestors will be proud if they weren't too busy trying to figure out why you're pointing that strange black box at everything. Do you have the photographic eye or are you developing that muscle? How many of these principles do you regularly use in your photography? Do let me know in the comments section below. If you got value from this content, then please hit the old like button and do consider subscribing for more photo, video and a drone related content from yours truly. Till the next time, guys. Ta-ta.